essentially, I spent most of my career in, uh, in numerical uh, numerics teams uh, at Intel and MKL. Uh, this is uh, essentially um, the team where uh, we contributed a lot. Uh, but we also developed mass libraries for compilers, uh, for other uh, tools like uh, OpenCL, uh, IPP, this is another library of signal processing. Uh, in 2012, we uh, started uh, the project which is called Data Analytics Acceleration Library. I was leading this project and essentially um, uh, led this new product to the market. And now my uh, new team focuses on Intel optimized Python. The product is uh, called Intel Distribution for Python. We're trying uh, to make Python uh, more accessible and more useful in production environments at scale. Uh, essentially, with such my background, I hope I can talk virtually about uh, any Intel tool today, I will try to be uh, high level uh, to give you some big picture uh, what Intel is doing for HPC and high performance data analytics and uh, what problems we are trying to address uh, with uh, our software. And also we'll, we'll do this uh, talk with focus on how this software is coupled with hardware, how we extract the best uh, performance from this hardware. That's uh, my intro. Okay, thank, thank you. And um, uh, I've forgotten to introduce myself for those of you <clears throat> uh, who don't know me. I'm Ray Loy. Uh, I'm in the performance engineering, <clears throat> excuse me, performance engineering group and I'm the training lead uh, for LCF. So um, um, what um, is new with this uh, session today is that we've invited um, two early science uh, project members, uh, Hui Huo Zhang and Marco Gavoni, uh, who work with, um, uh, is your project name West or is that just the code? Uh, you're muted. Space can you hear it's, me? Yes. 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 Is, the, is your project name West? Or is that just oh. the name of the code? Uh, West is the name of the code, and the project uh, is about yes. the early science of Qbox and West mm -hmm. on Theta. Uh, right. So, um, uh, so uh, in order to... Um, uh, uh, so thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to come, uh, and um, um, maybe you could um, uh, just say a few words. I think your uh, your um, your slides also introduce the uh, project, and we could kick off the talk with um, uh, framing it with um, the kinds of challenges that your project uh, has. So um, yeah. do I stop? You can start. Yeah. Okay. Um, so could everyone see the slide? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. So uh, I uh, my name is Hui Huo. From I'm a postdoc at Argonne National Lab, and then Marco is sit, who sit beside me is from Argonne too, right? And oh, yes. also University of Chicago, and the. Uh, I'm working on the Theta Early Science project. So Julia is the PI, and Marco and Francois is the co-PI, and also the developer of the two codes which we are using, uh, West and Qbox. And Chris is the um, um, catalyst for this project. So um, in this project, we we're, we're mostly interested in using these Qbox and West to study materials for energy conversion and energy storage. The type of materials we are interested in, including the nanoparticles and nanocrystal embedded in matrix and organic materials, solutions and bulk materials and like liquid uh, solid interface 
and also like uh, water at very extreme conditions like high pressure, high density. Um, so the code we are using include the Qbox and Wax. Currently, Wax is built um, in Quantum Expresso. So, um, and in the following, I will talk a little bit about West. So West is the, um, based on the many body perturbation theory called GW. And the way it works is basically, imagine you have a chunk of materials and you perturb the system by showing some, maybe the light to the materials. And this will induce a change of the electron density inside the material as is described in, uh, as the equation in the left side of the slides, uh, where chi is the key quantity we want to compute. And this perturbation, you, mathematically you can think about an array, an array, and then the induced electron density is in another array, and then the chi is a matrix. And in principle, this is infinite dimensions, and we, we want to like, have a better like um, cutoff for this uh, big matrix. So the way we do is to we um, do a lot of perturbation and then calculate the um, induced density. In this way, we can get this um, uh, response function. And this type of algorithm is um, highly parallelizable because we we can uh, we can distribute the perturbation into different group of processors. Um, so this initially can achieve very good uh, strong scaling property in uh, Bruton Q system. And then in this uh, in this early science theta early science project, we also add another layer of parallelization, which is a uh, band parallelization. So each time when we calculate the change of density, we actually calculate the change of uh, occupied uh, wave function on each bands. Um, and then we can distribute those uh, BAMs into different uh, group of processors. So this can achieve very good uh, strong scaling property with this BAM parallelization on theta machine. Um, and then so, so now because of the uh, this strong scaling properties, we can essentially focus on the, uh, the runtime for the one perturbation. So on the right hand side, which I showed is the runtime for a for one perturbation, um, and uh, this is a benchmark study for this uh, one K nail with respect to the four Bruton Q nodes. And as you can see, the runtime basically um, composed three big parts. The first part, the yellow part, is uh, FFT, um, which is the uh, 3D FFT. Um, the fast Fourier transformation with the grid size um, ranging from 100 to 500 for the for the system we are interested in, and and then this took took the majority of the time, and the second part is the DGM um, or ZGM um, operation, and this is the uh, ZGM or um, DGM of the uh, big wave functions matrix, which is essentially the uh, millions by thousands of dimensions. And this is distributed across these um, uh, processors. And then in, in West, uh, this, uh, we just, uh, excuse me. Uh, so in West, we just uh, compute these uh, local matrix. And then at the end, uh, West uh, do this uh, M, the O reduced by its home. So basically, this uh, ZGM or DGM is unparalleled um, version um, of the LAPAC routine, so, uh, not the scale LAPAC, but the LAPAC routine. Um, so it, it, most, it took about like 25% uh, of the runtime. And then the other stuff are just the um, array operation written ex explicitly, and also this MPI communication reduction of all those uh, matrices. Yeah. So the crucial runtime is the FFT time and then also the lab pack run um, subroutine DGM and ZGM. And then we, we do see a big improvement from bridging Q to KNL. So, so, uh, so, 
All right. I, I have one question, Hui Huo. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, um, um, are you um, coding these operations uh, on your own right now, or, or, or um, uh, are you using any kind of library or, or anything like that? Uh, you mean the, uh, the those FFT library? Yeah, the FFTs in uh, particular. Yeah. yeah, so the uh, FFT, we were using external library. So like in this in this figure, we in Bridging Q, we were testing the FFT W3 library versus the ESSL. Okay. And then on I see. NL, I see. Uh, yeah. this uh, Libsci FFT3 and also yeah. MKL. So MKL does give us like the best performance over others. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. And um, uh, we, I, we have oh, another part yeah. to work too. Oh, okay. Just one more slide. Yeah, just one more yeah. slide. Sorry. Oh, oh sorry. That, that's that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So this is another uh, called QBox. So for QBox, uh, this is uh, the left side is a storm scanning curve of a uh, hybrid functional uh, GFT calculations, which is considered to be the most in, uh, expensive um, GFT calculations. Um, so the red curve is the strom scaling curve. Um, and if you decompose the into like different part of the runtime, see that there are basically three um, type. The yellow curve is the um, exact change calculations, which is also um, composed by uh, the, a bunch of FFT calculations and with the same uh, grid size, roughly from 100 to 500 um, in each dimension. And this scale very well because this is uh, distributed into different uh, processor. Well, the other two part, which is uh, the apply of the Hamiltonian to the wave function, the apply of a big uh, meshes to a, a long array, and then also the um, update of the wave function um, each time. Um, this involves the scalar pack subroutine, like DGM and Chalaski decomposition. Um, this doesn't scale very well. Um, it, the runtime goes up to complete with the yellow curve. Um, so the, I, we found that the, the reason is that because those uh, matches are tall, skinny matches and it's distributed to so many number of processors, so the MPI runtime uh, dominates the, this code. Um, and then the, the, the temporary way to solve this is we just uh, um, do the scale lab pack in a smaller processor grid and then to keep the, keep the scale lab pack runtime as a constant rather than goes up. So then we can achieve the total runtime, uh, which is um, denoted as the triangular curve uh, much better than the original circle curve. Yeah, so for this QBox, the, the challenge is mostly with this uh, scalar pack, um, how to scale it to uh, like larger lumbar machines. Uh, yeah, so basically this is the uh, um, challenge we face right now. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. okay, so question. Yes? So straight MPI and no OPM within the node? OMP. OMP, sorry. <laughs> yeah, some, um, yeah, right, we have a question. Um, are you using mm -hmm. uh, straight MPI or are you uh, using any uh, open MP as well? Uh, right now, this for those uh, data I showed, uh, just uh, pure MPI without uh, open MP. Oh. Okay, so yeah. there might be some potential there. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. maybe some. Uh, if, if you are using MKL, uh, yeah. it uses OpenMP and then use, right? Sorry. Uh, well, you may not use explicitly OpenMP, but it may come through MKL, yeah. FFT, and LAPAC routines. Right. But most of the time, I uh, just set the OMP lump thread to be one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I, I did test the um, like OMP like performance for the uh, uh, FFT part. Um, so what we found is a hybrid 
um, FFT have almost the same performance with the pure MPI. So, uh -huh. and then because the other part of the code, uh, the OMP performance, um, like, still not very good. So, we currently we still like focus on the pure MPI phase. Uh, Interesting. Even for KNL. Even for KNL, uh, what mm -hmm. I found that the like changing between the pure MPI to the hybrid MPI and OMP and even to the pure OMP case, the performance is very similar to each other. In, so within think, a long, yeah. I think one good question is what um, what settings, environment variables, or, or other options might influence um, how uh, MKL does its threading under the cover? Yeah, yeah. For for me, I, oh, the environment variable that I said, uh, just the like uh, MKL num threads and MKL dynamics, like MKL dynamics to be false. Okay. Um, I hope we have MKL team on the call, but I cannot see him in the list of participants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can follow up with the MKL team on that question. Okay. If I can make a comment, uh, this is Nick. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, Nick. So um, uh, I, I actually just talked to DOE about uh, these two things. Qbox and West, um, uh, but one, so this is shown in the current Qbox slide. These, these are very unique matrix sizes, mm -hmm. and in, in other libraries, for example, IBM's ESSL, the threading doesn't work because it's not really optimized for these long skinny shapes mm -hmm. i mean the global matrix is tall and skinny as is indicated in that slide but even the local block is also right. going to be kind of tall and skinny and yes. if you just haven't coded mkl optimize it for these cases that may be an issue and then and then another issue which i know there was an mkl team the guys' names are Constantine and Eugene and Gennady. They were trying to rewrite some of the MPI routines um, so they would strong scale better by removing point-to-point -point communication uh, and replacing it with collectives. Uh, and I don't know where all this ended up, uh, but I'm looking through my emails to try to, to to find out and I can, um, but uh, maybe, uh, uh, so that might be, it's kind of orthogonal to the threading issue, but it, 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 it also, um, I wanna, it would be good to make sure those optimizations make, made it into the, uh, to the released version of MKL. Mm -hmm. Yep. You mean Konstantin, Arturov, Gennady, Fyodorov, and Eugene uh, Petrov? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They had uh, they had taken the QBox benchmark, which was uh, in Coral, which is slightly different from their version of QBox, but basically the same. And they were working on optimizations to improve MKL. And I, I don't know what was if. From my email, it looked like it went into MKL 2017 update one, but it's not 100% clear. Okay, um, so uh, thank you, Hui Ho and Marco, for um, giving us a, sort of an overview of where you are and the challenges. And at this point, I'd like to hand, hand it over to Sergey uh, to. Uh, um, 
uh, give a give an overview and hopefully um, have some tips on where you might go from here. And I uh, encourage anyone else uh, uh, that uh, you know you may have uh, similar um, issues or, or 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 even some other issues and and feel free to. Uh, uh, speak up, um, uh, you know, if, when uh, Sergey is uh, uh, giving uh, his slides, and uh, if there's something that you think might be applicable to your application. Okay, we can see your okay. slides. Very good. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, we can have uh, this discussion. Um, okay, so what I will cover today, I will cover several topics. Uh, what does it take to go through from HPC to high performance data analytics? And one of things that very specific for data intensive applications. It operates not with square data, but typically with tall and skinny data. That creates essentially a very new challenge for numerical algorithms like you deal with. Uh, but also it the challenge is not only on the algorithmic side, on the compute side, the challenge typically in high performance data analytics is uh, on uh, how to retrieve this data and how to transform this data in optimal way. So I will show you how MQL, Mass Kernel Library as a product, evolved from purely HPC oriented library to the library uh, that's most usable for problems uh, in high performance data analytics. And we'll uh, talk about how HPDA is different from HPC, uh, classic HPC. Then I will also talk about uh, artificial intelligence tools portfolio that we have at Intel. We'll talk about hardware a little bit. Xeon uh, uh, Phi is uh, clearly among these uh, artificial intelligence uh, hardware solutions that we cover. Well, but also have very specific uh, hardware options for deep learning and uh, other machine learning. We'll talk about tools, uh, classic machine learning tools that we have, deep learning tools that we have. And uh, finally, I will uh, spend a few minutes on uh, Intel distribution for Python. What we are trying to do with Python, I will show you some case studies and uh, you know, what kind of machine learning we can do with Intel Python. Um, from HPC to HPDA. You're probably very familiar with this picture, uh, which shows essentially uh, the evolution of the modern HPC uh, era, which is based on uh, commodity uh, CPUs. Uh, and the first uh, such HPC system was built in 1993. Uh, Beowulf is 94. In about the same time frame, Intel started working on optimizing uh, mass libraries. Uh, uh, in 94, there was first release of Intel optimized BLAS library. And officially in 1995, there was a birth of uh, Intel Mass Kernel Library, the release one of Intel Mass Kernel Library with optimized BLAS and optimized FFTs for Pentium processors. And later you can see that uh, with hardware evolved and with MQL evolved, MQL was extended uh, to support more and more uh, HPC type problems like with sparse blasts, with uh, 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 sparse solvers, uh, with cluster FFTs, um, etc. In 2005, Intel also released the optimized MPI library, uh, and it is it's evolved from uh, very 
uh, I would say uh, from very HPC focused, the latest release of uh, MPI, it supports uh, YARN, which is purely essentially uh, big data focused uh, technology. Okay, um, any questions about this slide? I will talk, uh, spend a few moments uh, discussing what does it take to scale. Scaling for the big number of uh, uh, processors and effectively using the hardware, it really means exploiting uh, parallelism at all levels. Not only cross-node parallelism, but also parallelism within a node. And um, this is becomes more and more crucial uh, as you have more and more cores, more and more nodes. On the very low level, uh, modern CPUs they uh, have instruction level parallelism. You probably all know that it's probably a bad idea to combine uh, a long sequence of uh, uh, reads or writes and then having long sequence of uh, compute operations, adds or multiplies. That's really bad use of uh, Intel um, uh, CPU ports. Whereas a better idea is to mix and balance loads and stores that gives you the best uh, arithmetic intensity, the best load of uh, compute ports. Likewise, uh, SIMD, this is really crucial for your application uh, to be uh, to use the full length of vector registers. In early era, in Pentium uh, era, uh, in uh, Pentium uh, 3 era, the vector length was 128 bits, so uh, just two doubles. If you don't use vector registers, you lose uh, 2x performance. For KNL days uh, and for Xeon Phi, it really becomes critical to use the full lens because the vector lens is 5, 12 bits now. Uh, the, for multi-trading, again, the number of cores initially, uh, CPU was single core. Uh, in early uh, in in ninety nineties, uh, uh, but uh, modern CPUs like uh, KNL it has dozens of cores, sixty uh, and more cores. Uh, that's critical to uh, to use all these cores. And finally, the multi-node. You have such a problems that do not fit essentially in the memory of one node, you need to distribute uh, the computation across the nodes. Um, with, with that, essentially, Intel created this set of software tools that can bring these all levels of parallelism for you out of the box in many cases. Cases. Like with Intel performance libraries, MKL, DAL, or MKL DNN, these libraries they they have pre-built uh, parallelism. Right? They are optimized to take advantage of uh, SIMD. They use uh, smartness for best instruction level parallelism, so you get highest arithmetic intensity. Uh, they are multi-threaded. Uh, some MQL components and uh, other product components, they are designed for multi-node parallelism. But also Intel has uh, programming languages. Uh, it has own C++ compiler, uh, Fortran compiler, and recently Intel Python. These tools also allow you to create the code, create programs that exploit instruction level parallelism, SIMD, uh, multi-trading uh, with OpenMP or multi-trading with uh, TBB or OpenMP in Intel Python. 
and we combining with MPI or uh, with a more machine learning specific library, which is a machine learning uh, scaling library, MLSL. You also uh, get optimized uh, cross node uh, communication technologies. And also, if you need a composable parallelism, uh, Intel TBB might be a solution. TBB is, stands for threading building blocks. That's the set of tools uh, combining together, you uh, can work to get the best parallelism uh, out of your HPC application or high performance data analytics application. I would like to demonstrate how MKL as the first uh, HPC oriented product evolved from HPC only to HPDA uh, to high performance data analytics problem. Uh, before uh, we dig into that, uh, I just briefly touch on uh, what I mean by analytics. Uh, there is traditional analytics, which is essentially more predictive analytics when you analyze historic data and do some statistical estimates. It can be uh, variance, covariance computations, or um, moments computations. It can be uh, robust statistics. Is if your data is uh, has outliers, uh, there are robust statistics methods uh, used for this analysis. This is kind of statistics uh, existed for years, for decades, actually. Uh, there is big data analytics, the same type of statistical algorithms, but focusing on large volumes when you um, really cannot feed the data in one node, you need to have a solution uh, to process these big amounts of data across multiple nodes. And there is a, a artificial in intelligence. Uh, some of uh, artificial intelligence, this is um, machine learning algorithms with classic machine learning uh, problems for regression or classification and neural networks. Uh, now highly developing deep learning uh, neural networks. So as I mentioned, MKL started as a product in 1995, BLAS, FFT, then sparse BLAS, LAPAC extensions. I was contracted by Intel in 2000 uh, to do research uh, how to um, uh, do efficient random number generation uh, at at huge volumes. That was probably one of the first steps uh, when MKL introduced functionality, uh, which is kind of on the border of classic uh, simulation and statistical analysis. And it was obvious that MKL can grow in that direction and introduce more and more statistical functionality, which we did in uh, 2010 by introducing the summary statistics, uh, classic uh, statistical descriptive methods, descriptive statistics methods, including robust statistics. Between that, uh, my team worked on some internal projects uh, related to uh, Hardware random number generation, uh, essentially having hardware source of entropy, good random numbers. And that was one of my first big data projects. We worked together with uh, hardware teams to create the math model to characterize the behavior of this entropy source as random number. Uh, are these random numbers good? They are independent. They are uh, non-correlated, they are uh, essentially uniform, etc. It was pre-silicon uh, work, but also was a post-silicon when we needed to characterize uh, the data coming out of many, many units and uh, tell whether in large volumes this uh, entropy source behaves as expected. The pre-silicon work was done uh, using R, R uh, language. It was nice, it, it's visual, essentially we could do it uh, 
very well, but when it came to analyze gigabytes and actually petabytes, close to petabytes of data, uh, you uh, R was potentially hopeless. We needed to implement everything from scratch, uh, re-implement R models in, in native language in, in C++. That was one of main motivations uh, to extend MQL with summary statistics functionality. So we realize uh, big data problems and big data statistical analysis is coming. If you see on the bottom of this chart, uh, in about the same time frame, there, are, uh, there were developments of uh, uh, a lot of tools. Uh, Hadoop uh, was created in about the same time frame. First deep learning packages uh, like Tiana, uh, classic machine learning packages, uh, uh, scikit-learn uh, were created, and we, by working on on that in this area and working with our customers, we quickly realized that to deliver something uh, useful for solving big data problems and uh, data intensive analytics problems, we cannot stay within uh, MQL. There, there should be created really new product targeting uh, high performance data analytics. I will explain a bit later what motivated us to do that. But you can see that in, in well, 2015, uh, both MQL uh, introduced the functionalities which are aimed to speed up the process of uh, data intensive applications. For example, batch jam, packed jam. These are things targeted for smaller matrices, for uh, skin and tiny matrices, and tall matrices. Uh, these kind of uh, problems that arise in high performance data analytics. And we created the new product, which is called Intel Data Analytics Acceleration Library. Again, um, Intel MQL has Chalesky factorization, QR decomposition, SVD uh, in Intel DAL has the same functionality. What's the difference? The difference, it focuses on a little bit different problems. MQL typically focuses on square uh, problems. Uh, DAL focuses on tall and skinny matrices, um, data sets. And Next, uh, actually, this year, uh, Intel also introduced uh, new function, uh, new products such as uh, MQL DNN or MLSL or Deep Learning SDK. We'll uh, touch on these products uh, a bit later. This is how essentially purely HPC product evolved from HPC to more data-intensive applications. So why? HPDA is different from HPC. Uh, first of all, let me explain what uh, problems high performance data analytics is typically working with. It works with big amounts of data, which means that data is really split across different devices. Uh, that's why it's really important to focus on distributed processing, but also, uh, these um, devices may not be uh, in the data center in a cluster with high performance interconnects. Some of these uh, data analytics happens uh, uh, between uh, devices with different, different connectivity technologies. So it's really important to design the communication avoidance schemas for distributed data processing. Uh, big data well, doesn't fit into your memory. Again, there are two possible ways how you process these uh, big amounts of data. You can distribute this data across nodes, or you can stream this data within uh, one node in blocks, so in blocks that fit into that, that memory. Uh, data. In data analytics, it's really often data comes in in time. Uh, unlike uh, traditional HPC, you have the data uh, stored somewhere, you, you retrieve 
this uh, data in full and process it. Uh, with data analytics, data may come uh, from different uh, data sources in time. So you have, uh, you may have special requirements for uh, response time. So you may end up using streaming algorithms to process this data. Uh, the data is typically non-homogeneous. Uh, there, uh, there are many reasons for that. Uh, in HPC, we typically do not care about uh, non-homogeneous data. We can always convert this and make it uh, homogeneous. Uh, floats to doubles, integers to doubles, and deal with uh, doubles or complex matrices, uh, etc. In data analytics, uh, data is a, by itself a problem. So when you store this data, uh, it it becomes important to store big amounts of data in compact form. So you really need to encode this data smartly. That's why uh, if your tensor gives the data in a, a range of uh, that width in a byte, you probably want to store this uh, on storage as, as a byte, etc. cetera. Uh, in data analytics, typically, in many cases, the data is sparse. Uh, so you end up with sparse data algorithms. The data may be missing or noisy. You, you may need uh, robust statistics methods or robust uh, methods for outlier detection, for bootstrapping, uh, if the data is missing. And also the last but not least, you often realize that data transfer and transformation is expensive. Even on the computation side, many of uh, these uh, data-intensive uh, algorithms, they have complexity, computational complexity, n p square, where n is typically very, very large. This is the number of observations, or number of rows in, of data. p is the number of features, and p is typically much, much uh, smaller than n. So this way you get really uh, tall and skinny matrix of the data. And because of that, NP square is not, it's often uh, not uh, much bigger than N and your data transfer becomes a visible part of your uh, uh, communication, uh, uh, of your data flow. So you really, in high performance data analytics, you cannot ignore uh, how you uh, load the data, how you transform the data. It, this is uh, what all makes the performance difference. Um, so to summarize, to highlight a few uh, things that I just said, in the big data world, uh, you cannot ignore how you store the data, but you cannot also ignore how you compute the data. You need to think of the entire data flow, how your data comes from storage, uh, feeds into memory, uh, transformed in the memory, and then uh, computed to get useful insight. And the worst is some of uh, this happens uh, not within data center. Your storage may be uh, in remote location, or your data source where the data comes, it, it can come from sensor, uh, which is not in the data center. You need to think of this data flow and address all these challenges, um, how you ingest the data and uh, transform and compute the data. So to summarize, uh, these two different worlds uh, that existed in HPC era. Uh, you have a storage, uh, well, uh, you install uh, Luster, 
uh, high performance uh, system and basically you forget about this uh, data load uh, problem. It can still be visible, but in HPC, we typically ignore that uh, phase and focus on the compute side. In data analytics uh, type of applications, we can't ignore that. Uh, we need to address uh, how we feed the data, non-homogeneous data, make it homogeneous because our uh, CPUs uh, work effectively with homogeneous data only. And that's all pipeline needs to be optimized. Essentially, that motivated us to create the new product. Uh, MKL traditionally focuses on the compute side only, but for data intensive application, you need to think of this entire data flow. That's why we created uh, Intel and Data Analytics Acceleration Library. Uh, to illustrate uh, what I mean by end-to-end -end analytics. Uh, the data center may be just uh, one piece of uh, your data pipeline where computation happen. Uh, in our example here, uh, we have in-vehicle system that uh, routes you uh, through traffic and you get this traffic information from data center where the data is aggregated from multiple sources. It can be video cameras, it can be R feeds uh, in toll stations, it can be uh, in vehicle information. Uh, all this data is aggregated. Uh, the model creates a, a traffic uh, map and this traffic map uh, is then loaded into your vehicle so the vehicle can route you in a traffic aware uh, situation. So in this example, the source of the data can be outside, in, actually outside of the data center. And the data is consumed again outside of the, the data center. Some part of analytics pipeline happens in data center, but the actual routing uh, happens in my car. I don't need to go to uh, data center uh, to route if I have the traffic map. So when we deal with high performance data analytics, uh, we cannot think of uh, here is a cluster of uh, compute uh, resources with high interconnects. We need to think of uh, really distributed computing across uh, non-homogeneous devices, uh, which are often connected not through high-performance uh, connections. OK, I'm ready to start talking about artificial intelligence tools portfolio from Intel. And in one chart, it essentially starts with hardware. Okay. Yes, okay, please. I, I, I don't mean to interrupt. This is, this is Richard. Um, maybe we should see if anybody has any questions about what we've talked about so far. Sure. Does anybody have any comments or questions before we head into this next part? Yeah, I have a question. So, uh, Sergey, could you say a few words about how some of the things you've talked about for neural networks, for example, et cetera, map onto things, more general considerations like tall and skinny matrices? Given that you know a key optimization in neural networks uh, in terms of implementation is to represent them in terms of matrix operations. I think I will cover this in deep learning section of the slides. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. Any and other questions? To other people. Yeah. Any anyone else? Remember, this is supposed to be interactive. We we don't need to just let Sergey keep talking and talking and talking. So feel free to jump in and ask questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So Intel's portfolio starts with hardware. Uh, it can be regular Xeon, it can be Xeon Phi, it can be FPGA based, it can be accelerator based, uh, deep learning accelerator based. 
uh, and of course um, memory storage solutions and uh, interconnects the next layer of this portfolio is uh, our libraries on the right hand side there are more general purpose libraries such as intel mkl it can be used everywhere for classic hpc but also for machine learning problems and there is more machine learning specific library that optimize optimizes this uh, entire data flow uh, data analytics acceleration library or dal on the left side these are more uh, machine learning specific uh, libraries and even uh, deep learning specific libraries uh, there is intel mkl dnn library which is the library of uh, specific numerical primitives that are essential for uh, deep learning uh, i will talk about mkl dnn in greater detail later but also these uh, primitives uh, they go into classic MKL uh, product too. The difference between MKL and MKL DNN is as follows. MKL DNN, this is open source uh, product. Essentially, this is an open source project. Uh, uh, all these uh, primitives available on GitHub. And it's actually a subset of MKL. Uh, Subset, subset of only primitives usable for uh, deep learning. The same primitives eventually from open source eventually go uh, to MKL library too. So there is a closed source product uh, pre-built MKL with deep learning capabilities and there is open source uh, counterpart. Uh, those who care about uh, source availability, they can use MKL DNN as open source product, those who need out of the box performance, they can use Intel MKL. There is a deep learning specific communication library, which is called MLSL, uh, machine learning scaling library. Uh, deep learning is often uh, a multi node, multi uh, device. Uh, process so this library abstracts the communication layer so you don't need to uh, implement the communication part and being fixed to mpi or any other communication technology so these are abstraction primitives that you can use essentially uh, uh, for mm -hmm. distributed uh, deep learning but not uh, tied to very specific communication technology and uh, coming product is a nirvana graph compiler essentially when you create the deep learning model there is a graph uh, and some of these uh, graph computations if you have a graph optimizer uh, uh, you can execute these uh, deep learning models much faster if you do these optimizations on the graph the next layer uh, which is actually not owned by Intel. These are typically open source projects, are uh, deep learning frameworks, uh, TensorFlow, Cafe, Tiana. These are examples of frameworks. And Intel works with the community to optimize these uh, frameworks for uh, regular Xeons, for Xeon files, and, uh, and also for accelerators. So these uh, frameworks, you get out of the box performance for Intel hardware. And these frameworks underneath use MKL, DNN, MLSL, uh, etc. On the right hand side, these are more general frameworks like Spark. Uh, Intel is uh, optimizing a lot uh, Spark uh, libraries and frameworks, BigDL, MLlib. And Python, in kind of uh, this framework or tools, uh, side what we do we package intel python with popular numerical and machine learning uh, uh, packages and uh, frameworks like intel python uh, comes with uh, numpy scipy scikit-learn but also comes with uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, deep learning frameworks and 
on a higher level we provide even uh, higher level uh, tools uh, like Intel deep learning SDK I will talk about this this is essentially how you create deep learning models and then deploy these deep learning uh, models in production and on the very top level these are a solution for particular markets uh, for automotive for uh, oil and gas for finance etc uh, let's talk a bit uh, more about hardware so there is a, a line of hardware solutions that we target uh, for machine learning of course regular Xeons or uh, Xeon files uh, some machine learning problems some um, data analytics problems run best on Xeon 5 processors some may run better on Xeon processors it's it all depends on the type of problem you have so both Xeon and Xeon Phi are critical for uh, machine learning when it comes uh, to deep learning uh, Intel has uh, special solution which is codenamed uh, Lakecrest. This is deep learning accelerator. Uh, for you to accelerate the deep learning uh, training, uh, you uh, use this uh, Lakecrest uh, accelerator. Um, and also, uh, FPGA based solution. Some of uh, machine learning in production uh, may may uh, require some extra uh, performance per watt uh, uh, efficiency targets uh, that you can achieve with regular Xeon or Xeon Phi. So you may have other reasons on why to use FPGAs uh, to, to have some machine learning primitives uh, implemented on FPGA. Okay. This is essentially a set of uh, a portfolio of hardware solutions for machine learning. A few words about um, Xeon Phi and Knight's Landing. When I said it's really hard to to say whether machine learning is better on KNL or on uh, regular Xeon, uh, there are so many factors that may impact uh, the performance. Uh, because Xeon Phi and uh, regular Xeon, these are very different architectures. First of all, uh, Xeon Phi, this is uh, uh, many uh, uh, many cores, but these cores are really not as powerful as Xeon uh, cores. They are based on Atom processor. Uh, with some HPC enhancements, but still this is naturally Atom processor. If your application uh, runs uh, as a single threaded on KNL, you will notice this with naked eye. It, it runs really much slower than uh, the same uh, non-parallel non sequential application on Xeon. So it's really critical on night's landing for you to uh, exploit uh, multi-threading as much as possible to get uh, truly uh, good performance. The other difference between Xeon and Xeon Phi, you probably all know, uh, Xeon Phi, at least now, it has L1 and L2 caches only. It doesn't have L3 like in regular Xeon. Rather, it has high performance memory, MCDRAM, which is uh, much, much faster than uh, DDR, but uh, it's still much uh, slower than uh, L3 cache. So that makes another layer of complexity. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to judge whether this uh, going to run better on KNL or on Xeon. It's very problem specific. And of course, integrated fabrics and the amount of DDR for memory is comparable to regular Xeons. 
to summarize, uh, when you scale your application from SSE or AVX to AVX 5.12, it's uh, really you need to understand that when we double the vector lens or uh, the performance increase is normally less than 2x. Because of Amdahl slow, you still have sequential parts of the code. But also because of these uh, uh, performance peak limitations, sometimes you really cannot get the peak performance uh, peak flops just because uh, you are limited by data access. Your arithmetic intensity is not as high uh, to be bounded by uh, flops. So sometimes if you can, you you should use MCD-RAM uh, to increase the throughput of uh, data access. But sometimes uh, your memory latency bound, so you may need to do something special about prefetching. And of course, uh, to get the optimum performance from uh, wider vector registers, you need your loop trip counts uh, bigger on Xeon Phi. If your loops are relatively small, then uh, you may not get uh, the full benefit of uh, KNL computations. Um, so, with all that said, uh, performance profiling tools uh, such as Intel VTune or Advisor, they're very, very instrumental based on my experience in understanding the performance and bottlenecks of your application and understanding how it will scale on KNL on the on fire. Any questions about this section? Okay. A few words about classic machine learning software solutions. And I start with MQL. So MQL is known for for GEM, for general matrix matrix multiplication. MQL is known for decompositions. These are typically uh, the main building blocks uh, that are used in HPC, but those are also essential building blocks for high performance data analytics too. And uh, on on the left charts you see the performance. Uh, speed ups and uh, performance levels that you can get with MQL on regular zones. On the right side, uh, this is on KNL. What you may notice that on KNL, the good performance is typically uh, you get only on relatively large problems. For smaller problems, KNL performance uh, is typically uh, somewhat lower than for uh, if you compare it to regular zones. That one of the challenges that we have in uh, data analytics, you deal with skinny and tall matrices and. Uh, Sometimes your matrices are relatively small, at least in one dimension, and that limits the amount of parallelism. Intel uh, MQL needs uh, to do something about that to deal with the small problems. And uh, recent additions to MQL were uh, so-called batched GM and packed GM computations. It's often when you have some um, machine learning problem, you end up with doing a series of GM uh, function, GM calls. For example, you work with sparse data and some of uh, uh, pieces of your sparse data may be more dense. 
you end up in doing uh, many, many uh, dance jams. Uh, and if you do it through regular jam, you end up in doing uh, small uh, matrix problems and general uh, jam in MQL is not very good in handling such uh, small problems. You cannot get good efficiency. So MQL extended APIs uh, to deal in parallel with many uh, smaller gems. This is called batch gem. So you execute in parallel uh, many small many small gems, so you get a much better efficiency uh, than doing the same thing through a series of uh, regular gem calls. Or uh, packet gem. What's packet gem? Packet gem when you have uh, a um, the same matrix multiplication a times b, but one of these matrices is a a or b uh, remains constant. So you do a lot of uh, a uh, times b computations where one of the matrices is constant. So in uh, the same uh, uh, very typical problem for machine learning. Uh, and deep learning specifically, when one of the matrices remain constant. For that case, MQL provides uh, APIs that take into account the matrix is constant and uh, only one of these uh, terms uh, changes over time. And you can see on these performance charts how much uh, more effective these uh, batched and packed GMs on regular zones and on KNL. Almost twice better performance on small problem sizes, and actually more than twice on small uh, problems. Okay. Uh, Michael, did I answer your question? Yes, very nicely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions about batch jam, packet jam? Okay. Just a few words about DAL. Like I said earlier, DAL was initially thought as an extension of MQL product, but we quickly realized that we cannot ignore the full data pipeline. So we need to create the library that deals with different stages of data analysis. And this stage, uh, just imagine you have a data source and a data source generates the data. You have may have multiple data sources. They are all different, generate data in different formats. One of your uh, typical problems is uh, to filter and normalize the data, uh, make it more uh, normalized. And also, if your data source is remote and you don't have high performance interconnect, you probably win want to minimize the data transfer uh, between uh, this data source and the device where you're going to compute uh, analytics. So compression, decompression becomes really important functionality. Sometimes you don't want to send this raw data uh, over public channel, so you need encryption, decryption, this type of things that you need to think of on the data source age. And then this data uh, needs to be transformed. One of important transformation stage stages when you feed this data uh, through a low performance uh, connectivity channels is the reducing dimensionality. You may have thousands or many uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, sensors and they'll uh, send the data uh, you may need to, that ends up with very high dimensionality problem. Uh, you may want to reduce the dimensionality usually using classic uh, techniques like principal components analysis uh, or other eigen uh, value problems. And finally, you get 
uh, this data uh, to to be analyzed one of uh, this analysis stage before you do modeling you need to understand the structure of the data so you run summary statistics you run uh, clustering better understand the structure of the data and then based on that information you start creating models uh, you create the model you train the model see how uh, good is this model you uh, repeat uh, the same process and you find finally find uh, the appropriate model you deploy this model uh, in a production environment and you again stream the data uh, you verify that this data uh, essentially uh, your model still behaves as expected and you do some decision making uh, predictions forecasting uh, or classification every of these steps can can happen on different uh, devices so the DAO was designed with keeping all this complexity of typical uh, machine learning problem uh, in hand um, so DAO is open source project uh, under Apache license it provides multiple language APIs we realize that when you does uh, modeling uh, you probably want to do this uh, in python uh, when you deploy something in production uh, if it's based on hadoop or spark it's probably java or scala uh, or when you need the best performance uh, you you need c plus plus so dal is designed to be multi-language uh, api library underneath it uses the best optimizations uh, coming through uh, from MQL. The difference from MQL, DAL is optimized for typical machine learning problems, in, in particular with these tall and skinny matrices. If you don't have questions about DAL, let's move on to Spark. So Intel works with spark community to optimize spark machine learning libraries mllib and big dl uh, which is a, a deep learning distributed uh, machine learning library on spark uh, mllib is already optimized with mkl uh, the work in progress to optimize mllib algorithms with uh, dal uh, functions so if you are using mllib uh, you will get the best performance either through mkl or through dal of course you can use uh, dal apis directly uh, with spark okay and now a few words uh, about deep learning software solutions that we have so we have deep learning frameworks tensorflow cafe etc each of these deep learning uh, frameworks underneath use deep learning compute uh, primitives. Uh, it uses a lot of matrix multiplications. Typically, these are uh, relatively small matrix multiplications. It has convolutions, again, uh, typically relatively small uh, problems. So on the other side, when it is distributed uh, deep learning, uh, there is communicational layer. TensorFlow has own communication uh, technology. Cafe uh, has own, uh, etc. What Intel has done, it created abstractions for these uh, deep learning primitives. For compute side, these abstractions go into, into Intel MQL DNN. On uh, the communication side, these abstractions go to MLSL. In this by doing this, we essentially created uh, the layer that you can then reuse underneath of any of these frameworks, TensorFlow, Cafe, etc., and automatically get the best performance on the range of Intel uh, hardware solutions. Okay, uh, any questions about that? Okay. And 
about deep learning. So deep learning has two distinct uh, stages, two distinct uh, steps. The first uh, step is to create the model, deep learning model. Uh, like in HPC, uh, you spent half of your career in developing the good model, and the second half of your career, you uh, optimize this model and deploy on uh, at scale. And the same thing is uh, for deep learning. Uh, on the step one, you are trying to find the uh, good model. And typically, this step is being done um, by domain specialists who understand the problem, deep learning problem, and uh, data scientists. So they work together to create the appropriate model. And for that side, you probably uh, need both uh, performance, but also productivity. This is very user interactive uh, part of deep learning. When you have a uh, relatively good model trained, the next challenge for you to be deploy this model in production uh, to run on target devices, and that by itself becomes uh, a problem uh, to be solved. So uh, Intel created the tool, which is called Deep Learning SDK, uh, to address both of these challenges. So uh, what Deep Learning SDK is? It has a training part. It focuses on usability and uh, interactivity. You don't need to be a good programmer. If you are a data scientist, uh, you may want to work through some nice user uh, interface to get um, uh, while uh, finding the best model. When you created this uh, uh, model, then you want this trained model to be uh, deployed on target device. And the target device, essentially, you need uh, this model or graph to be optimized for this uh, target device. So Deploying SDK has a deployment tool that takes trained model, runs through the optimizer uh, that uh, takes care of uh, the target device specifics. So you end up uh, in uh, having deployed the best performing uh, model for this particular device. Uh, so underneath deep learning SDK relies on deep learning frameworks. Uh, you can choose Cafe, you can choose TenderFlow, uh, Tiana. Uh, so in some sense, deep learning SDK, this is abstraction, higher level uh, thing on top of existing uh, frameworks. Um, and before I move on to the last section about Python, any questions about deep learning or machine learning software? OK. Intel distribution for Python. We're addressing about the same challenge. Remember, I told you this story uh, when I worked on hardware random number generation. We dealt with R, but it worked well only for um, prototyping stage when we created the model on relatively small amounts of data. When it comes to run, R in production, it it's became uh, useless. The same thing with Python. Python is known to be very uh, good language for rapid prototyping, for creating the models. But uh, running this at scale uh, to get the good performance, good efficiency in production, uh, that's probably not the good idea to use Python there. But it creates another challenge. And uh, many companies uh, cannot afford uh, hiring another team of software developers that take this prototype in Python and rewrite everything from, from scratch and optimize it uh, for uh, production. 
So our vision is that what can we Intel do to help in certain cases to deploy the model created in Python, not rewriting everything from scratch. Uh, so having maybe rewriting just a few uh, uh, small functions uh, to get the good performance or by using uh, certain technologies uh, when Python works as an interpreter in prototyping phase, but in production, Python works as uh, closer to static compiler of for uh, as JIT. This kind of uh, goals we have in mind when we created Intel distribution for Python. Uh, what we actually do to make Python more usable in production. Again, the production efficiency means essentially exploiting parallelism. What can we do to make uh, parallelism accessible uh, from all levels of Python? And when we start this, you really become, it becomes clear that working, uh, trying to find this solution on uh, uh, C Python side, which is interpreter, it's almost hopeless. Interpreter is uh, non-parallel by the design. Uh, you cannot get the good efficiency on interpreter side, but you can do something uh, with Python packages, or you can do something if you um, forget about interpreter and go into jitting space or into static compilation uh, phase. So we considered multiple uh, possible uh, directions how we can improve uh, efficiency of Python to make it more usable in production. Uh, the first and obvious thing, uh, I'm numerics guy, Python is known for really good set of numerical packages, NumPy, SciPy, scikit-learn. What if we optimize these numerical packages and accelerate with the libraries that we have, uh, native libraries that we have at Intel, MQL, DAL, and IPP? This is one of uh, low-hanging fruits that we are working. I will show some uh, numbers for you. The second is how to bring uh, parallelism in easy to use form to Python users. On the lower, on the nested level, parallelism comes through MQL and DAL. These are traded libraries. So if you accelerate NumPy and SciPy uh, with MQL and DAL, you automatically get uh, the parallelism. The problem is that uh, sometimes this uh, parallelism is uh, too granular. Uh, you cannot get the best efficiency if you parallelize on MQL or DAL only level. Sometimes you need to go to application level and do the parallelism on application level. And that creates the challenge. Uh, if I parallelize my application on application level, uh, how to make sure that this uh, parallelism is composable the, with parallelism that comes from MQL and DAL so we do not oversubscribe. That's uh, another direction where we actually work with the community to improve uh, Python. For multi-node, uh, we accelerate MPI for Pi with Intel MPI. Uh, to get rid of Python as an interpreter, there are uh, some nice technologies that you can use. There is Cyton, which allows you to use Python code, but then compile it uh, with C++ compiler. Essentially, Cyton translates Python code into C++ code, and then uh, you can compile this and get native code uh, that can run much, much better in production. Or you can use Numba, which is essentially LLVM-based JIT uh, ahead of time compilation. Uh, this, you can use the same Python code and with number, um, you can uh, JIT 
ahead of time this code and run in production. Uh, integration with big data platforms and machine learning frameworks. As I mentioned, Intel Python is shipped with scikit-learn. Uh, we also make sure that Intel Python works uh, with PySpark, which is Python interface to Spark. Uh, we ship Intel Python with uh, uh, Tiano. Uh, we make sure that it works uh, with best uh, optimized for Intel Tiano and TensorFlow and Cafe, etc. And the last but not least, uh, we created uh, extended Intel Vtune to support uh, Python, so you now can profile Python code, even Python code with Intel Vtune, or even mixed language code. You may have part of your application written in Python, part in uh, C++ or Fortran. Uh, Vtune will nicely profile this uh, complex application. Okay. To illustrate you uh, what kind of performance gains uh, we can achieve. Intel Python had uh, several releases already. Initial release was uh, last fall in 2016. In uh, January, we had update one release and in, uh, uh, in March, we had update two release of Intel Python. Uh, you can see on this chart is a speed ups of for FFT, one dimensional and two dimensional FFT in both NumPy and SciPy stacks. The speed ups uh, can be tremendous. The, what we have done essentially, we replaced uh, FFT layer in NumPy and SciPy with the other layer, which is based on MQL. So now NumPy and SciPy through this layer get access to the best uh, one dimensional and multi dimensional FFTs from MQL. That gives you up to 60 times better performance on FFTs. And if we measure efficiency, uh, these FFTs on relatively big problems they perform as almost as good as uh, MQL. We reach 90, 99% uh, efficiency of MQL. For doing FFT, you really don't need now to rewrite FFT Python code uh, into native language. You, you can run FFTs, multi-dimensional FFTs, uh, as efficient as native code, then with Python. What we also have done uh, on, on the Python side, you probably know that NumPy arrays, uh, they are managed by own uh, garbage uh, collector. And so NumPy intensively allocates and deallocates and copies a lot of data. And then it becomes a bottleneck data allocation and moving sometimes a bottleneck. What we have done, we replaced all allocations and uh, uh, memory copies in NumPy with respective uh, MQL optimized uh, copy, which is parallelized and threaded. So you really get much better overall NumPy performance on many, many NumPy functions uh, because of that. On the right hand side, you can see an example how Intel Tiana uh, has improved just because of better uh, memory copy and allocation uh, on NumPy side, like 1.5x on DB and Kyoto. Um, the other optimizations that we have done in NumPy, uh, there is a NumPy UMass functions. Essentially, when you does element-wise NumPy uh, operations such as adds, multiplies, divisions, or uh, running uh, evaluating transcendentals on NumPy arrays, 
this is where UMass functions come into play. MKL has respective uh, vector implementation of uh, UMass functions, which are threaded, which take advantage of full vector uh, lengths. So we replace this arithmetic and transcendental expressions in NumPy with respective MKL calls. And you can see on the left uh, chart the speed ups that we get relative to uh, reference NumPy implementation, up to 400 times better performance. So if your application is uh, does a lot of basic arithmetics or transcendental arithmetics on NumPy arrays, you may find uh, much, much better performance now than it was before. On the right-hand side, I illustrate this with the Black-Scholes formula uh, application, which is essentially uh, does a lot of number crunching with transcendental functions. And you see 200 times better performance just because of these uh, NumPy optimizations for your mass. Um, to continue with uh, Black Shoals, let me spend maybe uh, 10 minutes illustrating uh, how important uh, with Python to choose the right technology, right alternative to scale oh. Python uh, on KNL. So, Sergey, um, <clears throat> um, if you could. Um, uh, uh, we're 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 running uh, fairly late, um, so if you could. Uh, um, okay, just, wrap up. Uh, uh, not not uh, you don't have to wrap up immediately, but uh, uh, maybe not go into uh, extreme detail and uh, okay head, head toward the the finish. Yeah. Okay, I will skip this section then. Those who are interested, we can uh, take this offline. Uh, I will also skip uh, the mostly skip the composable multi-trading with TBB. Just uh, a few words. MKL and DAO. Oh, are you familiar with TBB, or should I talk about that? I think most people have some knowledge of TBB. Okay, okay. The beauty of TBB, it it's based on work stealing. So if you implement different levels of your trading based on TBB uh, scheduler, you automatically get a uh, nice way of uh, compos composable parallelism. So what we have done, MKL and DAL libraries, they provide TBB based trading layers. So essentially the trading of MKL and trading of DAL is done with TBB. And what we have done on Python side, we exposed uh, MKL and DAL through respective uh, numerical packages, NumPy, SciPy, or PyDAL. But we also mm, replaced uh, TPython, ThreadPool, and number thread pool with respective uh, TBB scheduler. And now Python users, they can get access, they can do trading on application level using TBB runtimes, which are composable with trading that you get in NumPy and uh, SciPy through MQL. This kind of problem that we addressed and to replace this uh, thread pool in C Python, uh, you basically need to do just a monkey patching, uh, Python minus M TBB uh, and uh, run Python application. Okay, uh, the speed ups, they can be really uh, impressive. Mm. This essentially chart illustrates uh, that with composable parallelism, you can get uh, more performance than if you use application level parallelism or MKL level parallelism only. Uh, for machine learning with 
uh, with Intel Python. Scikit-learn is based on uh, NumPy and uh, SciPy. Essentially, you accelerate Scikit-learn uh, functions just because you accelerate NumPy and SciPy. And you see that our NumPy and SciPy optimizations, they help to accelerate uh, certain Scikit-learn algorithms up to eight times. But that's not the full potential that we can uh, do. We additionally accelerated these uh, scikit-learn functions with uh, DAL, and you get another 160 uh, times better performance on correlation distance, for example, in k-means. And please note, uh, notice that correlation distance, linear regression, rich regression, these are typical linear algebra problems. One can think of, well, if I optimize NumPy and SciPy linear algebra, uh, that's enough to get the best performance uh, in scikit-learn uh, algorithms, which are linear algebra based. The answer is no. And the reason for that is, again, uh, in the area of uh, machine learning solves slightly different problem than uh, class uh, numerical kernels in MQL. Uh, classic nu numerical problems in MQL, they are focused on square problems. Here, we focus on uh, machine learning specific data sets. That's why we get much, much better performance through DAL, which is optimized for these uh, data sets. Okay, and that's all I have. Thank you, Sergey. Um... So, um, uh, I invite uh, the attendees to discuss uh, anything that they might have seen in uh, the presentation that, that might have some bearing on, on your own project. Uh, um, so, um, Marco and Huiho, are you still on? Yes. yes. Um, so, um, uh, Sergey, so uh, Hui Ho had uh, um, presented uh, some uh, um, sort of a wish list, and so what, what would you advise uh, in wrapping up uh, that they pursue? Uh, Maybe you what could, do you mean? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so, so um, on uh, Hui Ho's last slide, uh, he had some areas uh, uh, where he thought uh, that um, they could uh, make improvements going forward. Um, okay. So I made uh, some notes. Um, probably the best way for us to proceed is to follow up offline and uh, bring MKL experts like. Uh, Konstantin, Arturov, and other who are really focusing on this type of problems in uh, in LAPAC and ScalaPAC and uh, okay. FFTs. Yep. Uh -huh. If you can send these slides to me, uh, that mm -hmm. would be perfect. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought that uh, that Michael had forwarded them to you. Okay. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Okay. I we have can it. send you. We can send you another copy. That's okay. Okay. Uh, are there are there any other questions or uh, or comments? Uh, um, I'm also uh, we're very interested to know if uh, if uh, this topic doesn't um, um, resonate with your project, uh, then um, we would very much like to hear what. Um, what you'd like to see in a future uh, developer session. Um, and uh, please uh, just uh, drop us an email if you have a suggestion or talk to your catalyst. Um, so, um, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Sergey and uh, Marco and Huiho and everyone else. I have um, a question if, if I can ask. Uh, 
when I spoke to Michael, uh, he mentioned that uh, virtually every NL team is now focusing or looking for uh, machine learning. Can you elaborate a bit uh, on that? What kind of machine learning are you looking for? and uh, how it is related uh, well, to your project. Well, it, it is a topic of, of great interest. Um, I, I'm not sure what portion of the projects are pursuing that right now, but uh, Venkat Vishwanath um, is uh, uh, leading our data science uh, effort, and he, um, uh, I could hook you up with uh, him and uh, uh, get some more info. Yep, that would be very useful. 